right, so around AD 90 to 94, as I've told you before, an elderly apostle John, he sits down somewhere in Ephesus, takes out pen and parchment, and he pens, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he pens this letter that we get the privilege of studying verse by verse here 2,000 years later. Now, because what we're studying is God's word through his apostle, it's just as much, what we're gonna read today, what we're gonna study today, is just as much for us as it was for John's original audience 2,000 years ago. Now, in the part of the letter that we're studying today, it's gonna be all about a contrast. Can you guys please say the word contrast? So what, are we, what is John contrasting here in his letter? Well, he's making a contrast between a genuine believer and an unbeliever. Somebody who knows the Lord, somebody who doesn't know the Lord. And he tells us how we can know the difference. How many of you guys believe and know that only God can see hearts? Yeah, thank you, three of you. <laughs> how many of you guys, let me try that again. How many of you guys know that only God can see in your, your neighbor's heart or your heart? Right, yeah. Um, all of us. I can't see in anybody's heart right now. And you can't see in my heart. And so God, by the way, knows who belongs to him? But since we can't see into people's hearts, the only way we can tell the difference between a genuine believer and an unbeliever is by their fruit. Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. And so today, we're gonna specifically look at the fruit of righteousness in contrast with the fruit of unrighteousness. And so right now, if you're looking at 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, just say amen. Here we go. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. But look at this, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And then one of the most important verses in the entire New Testament. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. And so by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Who does not pra whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. All right, so from this passage, I pulled out three points. If you're taking notes, here they are. The first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the reason Christ appeared. Why in the world did God take on human flesh and visit planet Earth uh, 2,000 years ago? We're gonna answer that question today from the word of God. Then we're gonna get into the contrast that John makes between the unbeliever and the believer. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the signs of unbelief, and then we're gonna look at the signs of genuine faith. All right, so let's start with why. Why did Christ appear? And the answer is in verse five. I don't think you came here today to hear my opinions about religion. I think you came here today to get answers from the word of God, to hear the word of God, to find out how in the world we can grow. All right, so how do you answer this question, the reason Christ appeared? It's right in the Bible. 1 John 3, verse five. It says, you know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to, and I want you to say the next three words, take away sin. Okay, so that's your first point if you're taking notes. He, he came to take away our sins. And so the Bible's very clear whether you're talking about the Old Testament or you're talking about the New Testament. Ladies and gentlemen, our sins have separated us from our creator. 
Our sin has separated us from a holy God who created us. Therefore, we're in desperate need of reconciliation with him. It's as if there's this great chasm between us and God. And what's the only way across the chasm? The only way across the chasm is the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father. Nobody crosses the chasm but by me. You see, the bad news is this, that our sins have separated us from God. But the good news is this, Romans 5, 8, that God showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's good news. The bad news is this. Mankind is so far away from God. The good news is this, 1 Peter 3, 18, that Christ suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God. All right, so how did Jesus bridge the gap? He did it through what's called the substitutionary atonement. You see, Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he, that's the Father, made him, that's the Son, to be sin who knew no sin. What does that mean? That means that, as Peter told us in his little letter, that, that all of our sins were put on Christ. He took our sins and his body on the cross. And so for our sake, the Father made the Son to be sin who knew no sin. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so sinners cannot walk into the presence of a holy God until our sins are taken away, until our sins are forgiven. So what did God do in the eternal counsels of the Trinity? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God eternally existing in three persons. They had a conversation way back before the creation of the space-time material universe. They had it all planned out, the plan of redemption. They knew that if they create human beings with a free will, they knew that we're gonna make a choice to go astray. And yet God did not wanna make a bunch of robots who are programmed to obey him. What pleasure does he get out of that? And so for his glory, he makes people who have a free will, knowing full well that we are going to sin against him and need a redeemer. And they decided in the eternal councils of the Trinity that the Son of God would come, and he did. 2,000 years ago, motivated by love, God became man. He went to the cross as our substitute. Can you guys say the word substitute, please? Why? Because the wages of sin is death. We deserve death for our sins. And Christ said, no, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna be judged in their place. I'm gonna die in their place. I'm gonna shed my blood and I'm gonna provide an atoning sacrifice on their behalf. And so now, if, it's a big if, but if we will, by faith, receive Christ Jesus as the Savior and the Lord of our lives, here's what he's gonna do. He's gonna do two things. The first thing he's gonna do is he's gonna forgive us of all of our sins. And the second thing he's gonna do is he's gonna give us his righteousness. You can't beat it. Nothing's better than this. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he has bridged the gap. How? By forgiving us of our sins, if we'll put our faith in him, and by giving us his righteousness. That's how we get into the Father's presence. He came to take away sin. How does he do it? Justification, sanctification, glorification. I've taught it a thousand times. But at justification, right? How many of you guys understand that Paul taught it? We're justified by faith alone. And so at justification, what does God do? God declares us righteous. That's a declaration that is a legal term, justification. He declares that we're righteous. Nothing can ever change that. And then we enter into this thing called sanctification. It's a lifelong process of being separated from sin and to the Lord, of being conformed and to the image of Jesus Christ, more and more we become more righteous. Why? Because there is more righteousness. That happens through 
sanctification. Justification, we're declared righteous. Sanctification, he's making us more and more righteous. And then he finishes the job of sanctification at glorification because when we see him, we're gonna be like him. We're gonna see him as he is. He's gonna change us, give us new bodies, and that job is forever done. So, Christ came to take away our sins, but why else did he come? He came, he appeared, to destroy the works of the devil. Look at it, it's at the end of verse eight. 1 John 3, 8, B. <laughs> the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And so did you guys know that this truth right here, that he would destroy the works of the devil was prophesied by God way back in the beginning of our Bibles, way back in the Garden of Eden, way back in Genesis chapter three. And so after Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, after the fall of mankind, God made a promise. God promised that he would send a redeemer, that he would send a Messiah, and that Redeemer, that Messiah, would judge the serpent who led the first couple into sin. God said to the serpent there in the Garden of Eden, i.e. Satan, he said, he, the Messiah, is gonna bruise your head, and you, Satan, are gonna bruise his heel, and that's exactly what happened in history. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not teaching fairy tales. Everything in the Bible is grounded in history, and there's archaeological evidence, and there's manuscript evidence, and the greatest evidence of all, outside of the creation of space-time material out of nothing, the greatest evidence of all is the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this is not, you know, pie in the sky, by and by here. The Christian faith is real, and I hope you've em embraced it. But exactly what God says, everything he promises always comes true. And so the heel strike that Satan gave to Christ 2,000 years ago, the heel strike, what is that? All the abuse, all the spitting, all the punching, all the mocking, right? The, the, the heel strike was not permanent. You say, how do you know, Pastor? Because Jesus is alive and well and reigning over the universe, that's how I know. But the head strike, ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna be a fatal blow because in the future, Satan will be destroyed. And so through his death and resurrection, Christ crushed the head of the serpent. And the Lord spoke to my heart this past week, so I don't know who this is for. This is for somebody in one of the four services or maybe multiple people. So if you're listening right now, say amen. amen. But even though he... Uh, Christ crushed his head, his tail still swishes, but here's the good news. This is what the Lord spoke to my heart about. If you are a blood-bought, born-again child of God, the enemy has no power over you. No power over you. Stop being afraid of the enemy. He has no power over you. You belong to the king. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. First John chapter four, verse four. And so one day the devil will be cast into the lake of fire. That's Revelation 20. And then the Lord is going to usher in a new heavens and a new earth. That's Revelation 21 and 22. But even in the meantime, you gotta understand that again, if, it's a big if, you're a born again, blood bought child of God. You are a child of the king. Is the enemy gonna attack you? Yes. Will he try to oppress you? Yes. But ladies and gentlemen, he has no power over you. So cry out in the name of Jesus Christ when that temptation comes. Cry out in the name of Jesus Christ when that attack comes or that oppression comes. And we all go through seasons of this in our lives, but you gotta understand the enemy with a little pinky, God just goes beep, and he flies across the universe, praise the Lord. And so Christ appeared, why? Take away our sins, destroy the works of the devil. Here's what really grieves me. It's so sad that people hear this good news. They hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
and they had the attitude of, no thanks. They hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and they reject it. And so how can we tell who these people are? Only God can see hearts. Well, if you're taking notes, the first sign of unbelief is a practice of sin. We see that in verse six, and we see that in verse eight. Okay, so let's look at our Bibles. No one who abides in Jesus keeps on sinning. And no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. What does that mean? It means they're not saved. Look at verse eight. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of who? The devil. Okay, and so I'm just a messenger. Don't shoot me. If you want to send an email, send it to God. He's the one who wrote the book. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. All right, so we're talking about a person who practices sin, not someone who commits an occasional sin. Now, I don't know Greek, and so I rely as I'm studying whatever, 20 plus hours a week, because I really feel called to feed you guys, to feed the flock of God, the word of God. I don't know Greek, I got a D, minus, a D plus and a C minus in Greek way back 30 years ago, and so I rely heavily on Greek scholars. One of the Greek scholars that I rely on during the week is Chuck Swindoll, Dr. Chuck Swindoll. Most of you guys have heard of him. If he was here today teaching, he, he could use a Greek uh, New Testament and be fine. And so I want you to see who John is talking about here. Quote, John has in mind a person who commits sin continually, persistently, habitually as a lifestyle. He's not talking about an occasional sin. You guys understand the gist of where we're going here. Okay, and so this is one of the big differences between a genuine believer and an unbeliever. A genuine believer does not commit sin continually and persistently and habitually, but an unbeliever does. Why? Well, John told us back in chapter three of his gospel, because men love darkness more than light. They love their sin more than God. They want to be the boss of their own life. Thank you very much. That person doesn't want some God ruling over them, they wanna be the captain of their soul. And so, no thank you, okay? And so how many of you guys know that God's a gentleman? He doesn't force himself on anybody. And so this person, they got a choice, and they make their choice. They make their choice when they see the evidence of creation without, and the evidence of conscience within, and they keep suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And so there's a big difference between a genuine believer and an unbeliever. When a genuine believer sins, they're convicted by the Holy Spirit. And at some point, they admit it and quit it. Look at David. David committed two of the biggest ones in the whole book, right? Adultery and then murder, trying to cover it all up. And guess what happened? He's a genuine believer, and yet he's capable of that. By the way, all of us are capable of any sin in the book. Okay, so what does he do? He commits adultery and he commits murder, trying to cover it up. But guess what happened to David, the genuine believer? As he's in a backslidden state, he's absolutely miserable. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God is convicting him of his sin. And one day he finally broke, thou art the man. And then we have the beautiful Psalm, Psalm 51, where he confesses his sin to God. And so you got to understand the genuine believer sins, but they're convicted by the Holy Spirit. At some point, they repent. An unbeliever, no, there's no true repentance. I want to illustrate this by talking to you guys for a couple minutes about the Nile River, okay? Did you guys know the Nile River is the longest river in the world? And what's very unusual about the Nile is that it flows from south to north. Most rivers in the world flow from north to south, 
but not the Nile. Again, south to north. And even though the primary flow of the Nile is northward, you, you probably can see it every once in a while, there's this little turn to the west. And then sometimes, if we had a close-up, there would be even little turns where it's flowing south for a little while. But as you look at the entire river, you got to understand that those westward flows and those southward turns are just temporary aberrations. The primary flow of the river is northward all the way until it empties out in the Mediterranean Sea. All right, so the life of a genuine believer is like the Nile River in that the primary flow of our lives is northward, true north. What do you mean by that? What I mean is, metaphorically, by true north is righteousness. It's a righteous life. Why? Because we're so good in in and of ourselves? No, 10,000 times no. It's because if any man or woman is in Christ, they're a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. And so the reason the primary flow of a genuine believer's life is righteousness, not unrighteousness, is because God has changed them and he is changing them. And so who gets the glory for that? God. He gets the glory. Now, like the Nile, there will be times when even a genuine believer turns west. Or there may be times, and I think there will be times, I'm not advocating it, (laughs) but there will be times when a genuine believer even flows south for a little while, okay? And so I'm not teaching sinless perfection here. We covered this in chapter one, 1 John 1, verse 10, quote, if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us, okay? And so every once in a while, there's this little turn from to the west. Every once in a while, there's a little turn to the south, but because this is a genuine believer and that believer's been born again, those times of backsliding will only be temporary aberrations. And when they're backslidden, like David, they will be absolutely miserable. The most miserable people on the planet, ladies and gentlemen, are born again people who are backslidden from God. Absolutely miserable, why? Because God loves them and God is convicting them, and at some point they break, and when they, 1 John 1, 9, confess their sins, he is faithful and just to forgive their sins and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness, and they start flowing north once again. That's the truth. The unbeliever, nope. All right, so if you're taking notes, what's the second sign of unbelief? Well, it's a lack of agape love, a lack of agape love. We see that in verse 10. Please look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. Here we go. By this, it is evident who who are the children of God, who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love. Can you guys say the word love, please? It's agape in the Greek there. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. And so the Greek language is very descriptive, and it has several different words for love. Among the different words for love in the Greek language, there's phileo, there's eros, and there is agape love. So we're going to illustrate this with the love triangle. Okay, we start with phileo. Phileo in the Greek speaks of that kind of love that has to do with friendship. And so two people, maybe from different families. You know, maybe there's somebody in my life and he's a brother from another mother, right? But man, he loves me and I love him. We have this friendship and we have a close bond. It's brotherly love. That's phileo. By the way, Philadelphia, the city of what? comes from phileo, Philadelphia. Okay, so that's, there's that kind of love. That's a, that's a wonderful, beautiful thing that God has given us as human beings, friends. But not just that, there's eros love. Eros love, where we get our English word erotic, 
But eros love is that passion that a man and a woman enjoys together, hopefully only in their marriage. And that is a gift also from God. God created it. But I want to submit to you that out of these three different types of love, agape is the strongest form of love. That's why it's at the bottom of the triangle, because it should be the foundational love in a believer's life. In other words, we receive agape love from the Lord, and then we give it out to others. Okay, so what in the world is it? Well, often, not all the time, but often agape can be defined like this. Agape love. Now, again, you see agape a lot in the New Testament. It doesn't mean this every single time because you have to, you have to interpret every word in the context. But many times in the New Testament, agape means a faithful commitment to, please shout out the word, give sacrificially to another. A, that's agape love, a faithful commitment to give sacrificially, selflessly to another person. And of course, agape love is found in the most famous verse of all of the, in the entire Bible. John three sixteen. for God so what? Love, that's agape. He so loved the world that he what? Gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish. Hell's real, ladies and gentlemen. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so there's no greater example of agape love than the father giving up his son to come into the earth and to sacrifice himself on the cross. And there's no greater example of agape love than the son giving up his life on the cross for us. And there's no greater example of agape love than the spirit coming and giving us this gift of agape love. Ladies and gentlemen, it says it right there in Galatians chapter five, the fruit of the spirit is love. You look up in the Greek, it's agape love. Now I'm convinced, you may disagree with me, but I'm convinced that only genuine born again believers can display or show agape love. And the reason why is because the fruit of humanity is, a, is, is love? No, 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 is agape love? No, no, no. The fruit of the who? Spirit is agape love. And so you've heard me say it a thousand times, but when a person's going their own way, doing their own thing, living for themselves, I'm the boss, right? But then they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and realize that they're sinners in need of a savior and they turn to Christ and turn away from their sin. I'm not talking about cleaning up your life. You can't clean up your life by yourself. You need divine help. You turn to Christ away from your sin and you by faith embrace him as the savior and as the Lord of your life. The spirit of God comes inside of your body and with him he brings the gift of agape love. That's the good news of Christianity. And so now, born again Christian, you and I have the capacity to love in the agape way. And as we're going through that sanctification process and we're yielding every day to the Holy Spirit of God, what is he doing? He is giving us agape love and we are overflowing and then we're supposed to be giving it out every single day to other people. Let me tell you something. If we get a hold of that one truth, I teach so many truths every single weekend, but if we as a church will get a hold of that one truth, we will not be able to stop people from coming to Calvary. Why? Why, why, why? Listen to this. Why? Because they don't want our legalism. They don't want our criticism. They don't want a bunch of Pharisees around them. They don't want gossip. They don't want backbiting. They don't want a lot of the stuff that you see in so many churches. What do they want? They want agape love. And if we are full of the Spirit of God, we're going to be giving that love, love, love to other people. And when love is in the house, the house is packed. And I heard that on a rap song from the 90s. And <laughs> Sorry, I'm a child of the 90s. So let's look at this genuine love. I mean, this, the signs of genuine faith. If you're taking notes, not just um, signs of unbelief, but now signs of genuine faith. And the first one is a practice of righteousness. Look at it in verse seven. This, this, this verse blows me away here. Right into Christians, he says, little children, 
Let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous. Now, this is the part that blows me away. As he, Jesus, is righteous. Isn't that amazing? So whoever is living this lifestyle of righteousness, not perfection, whoever is living this lifestyle of righteousness is righteous as Jesus is righteous. So why do we practice righteousness? And I gotta say this again, because I cannot be misunderstood. Why do genuine believers practice righteousness? Is this, is it, you guys can interact here. Is it because we were born in holiness? <laughs> is, it before, is it because we're so good in and of ourselves? No way. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason that we practice righteousness is because God has intervened in our lives. If you think it's because you're so good, you haven't even understood the basic 101 Christianity. Paul told us in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, that in our BC days, listen to this, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We followed the way of the world. We were led by the prince of the power of the air. That's the devil and his demons, whether we knew it or not. We lived in the passion of our flesh, and we were children of wrath. That's us in our BC days. But then God intervened, and it looks like this right here. He says in Ephesians chapter two, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ by, can you guys shout out grace, please? Grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so the reason that we, as born-again Christians, live lifestyles of righteousness is because God intervened. God has saved us by his grace. God has changed us, and he is changing us. Here it is. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. Don't forget verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works for good works, so we're not saved by good works, we are saved for good works. And so this whole thing about works righteousness, this whole debate within Christendom about our works necessary for salvation, right? Listen, this whole thing can be settled by just memorizing two words. If you're listening, say amen here. Amen. Two words, they start with E, super easy. Earn evidence. We do not earn our salvation by good works. If we could earn our salvation by good works, why in the world did Christ die on that cross? We cannot earn our salvation by good works. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that genuine salvation, what does it do? It shows itself it gives evidence by good works. Earn, no. Evidence, yes. You guys following this? There's a, I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but it's that easy. If you just memorize those two words, you have no problem falling into the works legalism, the gospel that is no gospel, trying to earn your way to heaven. Now, what if somebody says a little prayer but there's no change. What if somebody says a little prayer, there's no evidence in their life? There's no works. Well, James told us, faith without works is what? And I love what John Phillips said here. If we do not have a belief that behaves, we probably don't have a salvation that saves. You see that? So what am I saying here? What I'm saying here is that Evangelicals, everybody look at me, make sure you see I'm doing this. Evangelicals, right, who say a little prayer, but then their life doesn't change. 
and there's no fruit of righteousness. What's the truth? Are they evangelicals? No. John says, more important, God says, they're children of the devil. Why? Because they're practicing sin. So maybe they need to go back and try saying the prayer again. And of course, I'm half joking here. Maybe they need to go back and really mean it. Maybe they need to go back and really understand the gospel. You see, why is this so important? Because ladies and gentlemen, all eternity depends on understanding this. All eternity depends on your choice. And so a true conversion looks like this. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So a practice of righteousness, that's the first sign. What's the second sign, if you're taking notes, of genuine faith? Well, it's a turning from sin. And we see that in verse nine. Again, one of the most important verses in the Bible, you should memorize it. 1 John 3, 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So why is this person not practicing sin, persisting in sin? Um, their lifestyle is habitual sin. Why, why is that not happening? Because God's seed abides in them. What's that? Charles Ryrie defines God's seed as, quote, the divine nature given the one born of God. And this nature prevents the Christian from habitually sinning. Does this make sense to you guys? And so I want to wind down and end the sermon um, by giving you my brief personal testimony. There's been so many new people here in the last year. Many of you guys haven't heard this. And so when I was growing up, I went to church every single Sunday. I mean, we never missed. But I gotta tell you the truth, to be honest, I didn't get hardly anything out of it. You see, the problem was I knew about the Lord in my head, but I didn't know the Lord in my heart. And so in my senior year, a friend gave me a gospel track. I didn't even know what a gospel track was. But here's what I knew, that this guy stood out, this guy was different than um, so many other people in my high school. This guy loved people. This guy just had a glow about him. This guy wasn't weird. By the way, that's important. And I was open to it, and I took the track. I took it home, and I read it. And one of the verses on the track was Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which I've already shared with you. Okay, so, by grace, you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. I'm reading this, right? Not of myself. What? It is a gift of God, not of works. And I'm like, what? Lest anyone should boast. And for the first time in my life, I started becoming under conviction. Why? Because I realized I was troubled because I thought I was a good enough person to go to heaven. I said my prayers every night. I went to church every weekend. I respected my parents, at least, you know, some of the time, I don't wanna lie up here. Right, so I was a quote unquote good person and I'm reading it and it says not of yourselves, not of works. And so, I'm really troubled and I was working at my night job, 17 years old at Little Caesars Pizza, Del Mabry Highway, two miles south of Tampa Stadium and I'm there, I'm washing dishes and I'm thinking about verses on a gospel track. How many of you guys know that God doesn't want anyone to perish and he keeps drawing us and drawing us and drawing us? And I'm there and I'm thinking about the verses on the gospel track especially keep thinking about one that I quote to you guys every single weekend. So now you know why this verse I quoted so much. It made a huge impact on my life for the last 39 years. And that is this. The wage of sin is and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the light bulb came on in my little 17-year-old brain and I finally understood. If you're listening, say amen here. I was not a good person who deserved heaven. I was a sinner who deserved to be judged for my sins. You see, you cannot get saved till you admit you're lost. 
But the good news is the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it hit me that God loved me so much he didn't want to judge me for my sin. I want, to hear, I want you guys to hear that. God loves us so much he doesn't want to judge us for our sin. So what did he do? He sent Christ. And Christ was judged as our substitute. He died in our place and rose again the third day. And so when I believed that, when I transferred, right there at Little Caesars, when I transferred my trust from trusting in Mike Wiggins to save Mike Wiggins to trusting in Jesus Christ alone to save me through his death, burial, and resurrection, when I trusted Christ alone, something had been out here for like a year. I couldn't explain it, but whatever that was, and I know who he is now, went from there inside of me. The Holy Spirit came inside of me. Wave upon wave of God's agape love, wave upon wave of God's forgiveness came inside of me right there. And in May of 1984, I was born again. Why? Because I'm so good? No, I'm a sinner in need of judgment, or a sinner who deserves judgment. It's God's grace. It's God reaching down from heaven, not me reaching up from he- for earth to heaven. And why was I born again? Because G- Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, listen, who were born, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but were born of God. And then what happened? I started practicing righteousness. And I started to stop. I stopped practicing sin. Now I still sinned. Because if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But I saw more of a consistency in my life. Why? Because ladies and gentlemen, listen, listen, listen. His seed was now in me. It's by grace. And so to recap everything, if you're taking notes, the reason Christ appeared is to take away our sins and to destroy the works of the devil. The signs of unbelief, a practice of sin, and a lack of agape love. The signs of genuine faith in contrast, it's a practice of righteousness, and it's a turning from sin. And all God's people said,